This is our fourth session of the research presentation series. Uh, we've had in the past Yosip, uh, Fernando, Milon, uh, Fernando Munoz Boulon, and Maria uh, Sanchez uh, presenting. Emanuela has presented, and Luca, you are the fourth speaker in the series. Uh, I think I have been able to get Jeremy uh, to, to come in uh, to the next session. So we will have that. We are having this series once in every two months. It's a bi-monthly uh, effort. And the idea is to get a bunch of scholars and researchers to converse with each other. Luca Manelli, friends, is the Assistant Professor of Strategy and Enterprise and Family at Politecnico di Milano. His uh, research interests lie broadly at the intersection of family business, organization theory, and strategy. And his research has appeared in journals such as Strategy Science, Technovation, and FPR, Family Business Review. Uh, today, he is going to present on the experience of institutional paradoxes in next-gen family members as a driver for purpose change in the family office. So over to you, Luca. Thank you so much for accepting our invite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tulsi. Thank you to everyone that is attending this, uh, this seminar. Um, thank you for the invite. And uh, uh, I feel very honored to continue this um, uh, long, uh, long legacy of uh, of researchers that have been invited uh, to this this seminar. I hope I will be up to the level of the previous um, of the previous participants and panelists. Um, so, can you see my screen first of all? Yes, please. Awesome. So, um, as uh, Tulsi was uh, was saying, the, the the seminar that I'm going to deliver today is about um, a topic that I came across a few years ago, um, which sparked my interest from the beginning, which is um, the purpose of the family office and the transition towards the impact of family offices. And I think that during my um, career and during my um, position, as a co-director and lead researcher of the Family Office Observatory at the School of Management of Politecnico di Milano. I think I've seen a few examples of multi-generational family offices that are transitioning towards the logics of impact, sustainability, um, and prosociality within their family office. And for those who don't know, the, the Family Office Observatory is an applied research project uh, that we run every year. So we, it's, a, it's a, an evergreen research project, which renovates every year, which tries to gather data, primary and secondary data, on the emerging trends that family offices and enterprising families are, are facing. And um, as such, we do a lot of um, outreach with stakeholders, with families, with advisors, with bankers, with lawyers, with uh, accountants. Uh, and so uh, I'm very glad to say that every year we do around 100 of interviews. We run a survey. Um, uh, we do secondary data scratching, scraping, and analysis. So uh, every year we collect a, a vast amount of data on the topic of family offices, family wealth, wealth management, and so on and so forth. Today, I'm going to talk about purpose change in the family office, the role of institutional entrepreneurship by next-gen family members. The title seems very uh, ambitious and quite complex, but uh, I hope I will try to um, narrate and uh, diminishing the, the complexity, the perceived complexity of, of the topic as we move forward. And I, I would like to diminish the complexity, first of all, by investigating the phenomenon at hand. Um, so we are witnessing a rising tide of um, impact investing integrated and grafted within the family office and within the strategy of um, wealth allocation of owner families. Here I put a few headlines from the Financial Times 
which says rich millennials push to put family wealth into impact investment. Young urge elders to back ESG linked projects instead of traditional philanthropy. Or another headline is climate concerns, climate concerns reaching tipping point for family offices. Younger members of wealthy families are exerting pressure on their elders to review their investments. So these are all articles that, that, that were published in the Financial Times just a few, a few months ago. So um, what I'm talking right now is really something that is uh, really ongoing and it is gaining momentum. It is gaining momentum also because um, service providers like banks and uh, trust advisors and uh, wealth managers are increasingly um, having interest or increasingly having interest in uh, how to transition family offices towards impact. And on the right hand side of the screen, you can see a report supported, uh, published by the Impact Investing Institute and supported by the Schroeder Support Management, which is which focuses on family offices or road to imp or roadmap to impact. So um, people, stakeholders are building something that previously was only captured by traditional philanthropy. If you read these uh, headlines, um, there's not only the topic of shifting the strategy from wealth preservation towards impact, but, but there is also the role of next generation family members. So younger family members that apparently are leading change within their family offices. And this is what I'm, I will talk about today. Um, this is a um, the heiress of the family that founded BASF, the Angelor family. BASF is one of the most important uh, chemical companies in Europe and probably also in the world. It's, it's, uh, I think it is uh, located in um, close to Frankfurt in Ludwigshafen. Um, and Marlene, uh, who is around 31, 32 years old, um, has been making headlines in newspapers all over the world because um, she's a great advocate for redistribution of wealth, land, and power, and for a um, vocal advocate for um, taxing billionaires and taxing wealthy families. And this is interesting because she comes from one of those wealthy families. It's actually probably one of the most important uh, business families in Europe. Um, and so I think we're witnessing a, um, a trend that we cannot, we cannot ignore. Um, and as I said, this trend is coupling societal trends uh, and specifically shifting the shift in practices within the finance and financial industry with uh, you know, generational trends. So we know a lot about millennials, Gen Z, baby boomers, and the fact that our societies are getting uh, more and more wide in terms of number of generations that coexist together, uh, thanks to the fact that you know, the, the, the length of the human life is a uh, Increasing is increasing over time, um, and uh, but but also uh, having different generations uh, inhabiting and coexisting, coexisting together also implies um, managing uh, differences in values, differences in resources, differences in interests, differences in positions, and also um, all the processes that that link one generation, one societal generation to the other. Mm -hmm. Um, this happens, for example, this is very important, for example, I come from Italy. Uh, we, are, we know that this is very important for the sustainability of, of our wealth, welfare system because uh, without, uh, you know, people paying taxes and people creating jobs, uh, um, it is difficult to sustain uh, a large amount of people that have uh, retirement and depend on, on the state to get retirement. Um, 
And it is also important for companies because if you have a company where you have three or four generations that work together, this all, of course, it implies very taxing uh, issues in terms of leadership, culture, strategy, and how to develop a common vision for the future of the company, which is often what makes or breaks successful companies. Here you can see some of the uh, associations that are uh, at the forefront of the impact revolution in private investors and family offices. You can see the impact, uh, which is an association made by uh, wealthy family members, uh, currently led by the next generation of the Rockefeller family. We have Generation Pledge, which is an association of, again, family, wealthy uh, family members that pledge to donate uh, a portion of their wealth across uh, you know, the, their lifespan and uh, pledge to ensure that such wealth is um, deployed to exert significant and positive impact in the world. And then there is Tonic, which is an association where members exchange best practices and, and knowledge and uh, you know, around uh, impact investing practices, strategies, and so on. Is there any questions so far? Sorry, no questions. No questions, okay. No questions. Let me move on then. So, um, so this is a phenomenon. So, um, so I'll, just, I'll just make one point, Luca. It's very ahead, interesting please. that you're talking about this because I think um, some of my, the people who have joined in because some of them are not from SPJMR, uh, would also be able to attest to the fact that in India, we are going through a very interesting discussion about inheritance tax, right? And uh, for the wealthy to say uh, that, you know, you need to have a 90% tax uh, is, is very interesting. Absolutely. And, you know, and this is another point that um, is interesting to address because um, intergenerational wealth transfers are predicated on also tax efficiencies, right? Yes. And, and the sustainability of family wealth across generations is also predicated not entirely, but partially upon tax efficiencies. And of course, this also implies, but it, it also, it, it is a very uh, complex and important issues though, an issue though, because it also implies issues of whether value is created or destroyed thanks to these ta the taxes, or uh, whether families uh, should be, you know, considered or pressured to be responsible citizens and avoid, you know, not to um, and avoid to engage in those tax erosion practices. So it is something that not only research and family members are talking about but it is something that it is uh, uh, an ongoing conversation also in professional associations, um, in, in tax advisors, wealth managers, and so on. So again, uh, what, I'm, what I'm describing is only probably the, the tip of the iceberg of um, broader societal discourses that shifting, are shifting logics from what we have been witnessing in the past, and you know the, the the present and the future. Thank you for the for the question. Sure. Very interesting. So, um, however, uh, uh, my my focus is is not on finance. I, I I'm not a finance uh, researcher, but I'm a family business researcher. So, um, before engaging in, you know, talking more about what are family offices, let me just give you. Um, a, few, uh, a brief distinction that I think it is, however, important to make to ensure that you know we, we are on the on the same page. And the distinction is the shift in focus between from from the family business to the business family. Mm -hmm. um, so the family business field has been um, you know ripe with studies and and, and um, investigations about 
the firm, the family firm, the family owned company. Uh, it has been investigated whether family businesses outperform non-family businesses, what are the most uh, efficient and effective succession processes, what is the best uh, governance configuration for family businesses, and so on and so forth. Um, however, uh, it is important to notice that in recent years, um, family businesses, female family business researchers have been uh, questioning the centrality in their perspective on the, fa the family business. And instead, uh, many of them are advocating for a shift in focus towards the business family. So a shift from the business to the family and ownership components of the tricycle model, right? Um, so, uh, for example, one uh, implicit assumption of, the, fa of uh, the family business perspective is one, one business, one family. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, the classic assumption that family business do, family business researchers do, right? So there is one family which owns one business. While this is not always the case, uh, we know, and I'm sure you know, many families that do not own only one business, but they only they own a portfolio of businesses, and uh, within such portfolio you have businesses at different stages. So you might have, you know, very early stage ventures and small businesses. You might have businesses that are mature, and which are already doing, you know, um, you know, revenues and growing and so on. You might have businesses that have been sold, right? And this is the build, sell, harvest uh, cycle, right? The, the cycle of entrepreneurial recycling of family equity that Beer and Kammerlander talked about in the 2019 paper. And this is how family owners um, think, right? They don't think if you have a if you are a family investor and a family owner of multiple businesses that are that, that is diversified and not connected to one core operating business, they think like this. So thinking as owners of a portfolio of companies and thinking strategically about um, whether they could add value to each of them and how. So another assumption of the family business perspective is that family owners accrue social emotional wealth, SCW, by exerting influence on the family business and by pursuing non-economic goals through such business. Um, and this, is, this, is, this has been you know, uh, considered the main uh, driver for the distinctive behavior that family businesses exert or, or perform or have compared to professional non-family businesses. Family businesses have non-economic goals because there is a family behind it. Um, if you shift the focus from the business to the family, then we think of a diversified portfolio of businesses potentially where not all of them, not all of the, not all the business are equally conducive to effective attachment by the family. Some businesses might be more core to such effective attachment. Some people, some, some, some businesses might be more peripheral to such effective attachment. And so they might be just, they might just be invested and divested as, as they want without much uh, family influence. Within the family business perspective, you have this idea of, of succession, which is a transfer of ownership and or management, management power from members of one generation to the other within the business. So I am the father uh, and I transfer, and I'm, uh, I'm the father and the CEO of the business, I transfer the CEO role to my son or to my daughter. I am the shareholder of the business, I transfer my equity shares to my nephew, to my aunt, to my to my children. Um, and this is the classic succession process. While if we think about the business family, and here I uh, come to what Tulsi was saying, I need to consider intergenerational wealth transfer issues. Because it's not, it's not only about the business, it's also about the wealth. So about the, the stock of resources that are not immobilized in the business, but might be you know, real estate assets liquid investments, illiquid investments, um, 
passion assets, and so on. So another core issue for the business family is to sustain family entrepreneurship beyond the family business. So ensuring that next generation family members, for example, are entrepreneurs and are able to create businesses and create value for society. But this does not mean that these family members need to get involved in the family business, right? They can found different businesses. So as you can see, you know, different perspectives, and I think they are both important and both are useful. Um, however, we know a lot about the family business perspective. We know less about the implications of having a business family perspective. You know, um, one one yeah. question, Luca, if you can just uh, go back. Yeah. I think it is such an interesting perspective, especially your third bullet point under the business family. And this is just uh, my observation that when you're talking about the growth of the family business and the fact that the business family itself has this portfolio of businesses at various stages of maturity, it just strikes me and I find this perplexing what is it that the family is going to consider as as the family business has to do more with the effective yep right i mean i i know of this large indian family business which has been typically into soap into detergents okay and now they have diversified into various other businesses cement and pharma and chemicals and all kinds of things. They've had some uh, acquisitions in the US as well. But the family considers the detergents as its business. Mm. And the ones which it has acquired, they are technically family business because it, it kind of uh, ticks all the boxes of what is a family business. But the effective attachment is not there. So are you going to consider that as your family business? Is a very interesting question, and I, I totally agree. And uh, we, you know, uh, there there is plenty of implications here. For example, right? So, um, if you consider your family business as you know one business, your or your flagship historical business mm. um, among a portfolio of businesses, then I suppose that. Um, you might have um, different risk preferences for the family business and for the other businesses. But at the same time, uh, there might be ad um, additive effects in the sense that if you are a family owner, you usually think you have an architectural vision of the family portfolio of businesses, right? So you don't, see your family business as being at the center only of your architecture and portfolio of businesses. But you see also different businesses that um, create value, create resources that can be um, invested within the core business yeah, or that's, that's, the the galaxy, by the family. that's the galaxy uh, research exactly. Alfredo and uh, Kotler. Just yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. So, and this is very interesting, and so uh, and so much underexplored. So, yes. uh, I uh, think it would be very, very interesting to, to know more I about. Think this is very, very exciting. The effective part is very exciting. And there is also the the family identity side, right? Because family businesses sometimes also provide a source for identity meanings for the family. Right. So they say. You know, a family member can say, we are a family of detergent sellers or detergent manufacturers. Right. And if this is your identity, then you have a certain view, view of what the market is, what strategy is, and how you see yourself. And this obviously has implications for how you run the business and, uh, and how you run other businesses. But let, let me tell you this, for example, however, think about a family that says, um, we as a family are in the business of improving people's health, right? 
So in this case, you don't have a, an attachment or a connection to just one. Uh, a one business line or a one specific market, but you can source your pride, meaning, and connection to not to a specific function of business, but to a, a multiplicity of businesses that are coherent with the, the purpose of your family. Hmm? And this is very interesting, by the way. So um, again, and this is, I think, one of the drivers that can enable, or one of the mechanisms that enable family families to survive and thrive after they uh, had a liquidity event, after they sell the family business, which is, which so they become business families uh, and they can become investors. Okay, so, um, so, the, family, the, the business family perspective is important to make sense of specific uh, processes and phenomena and mechanisms that deal with wealth in general, the wealth of the family. Um, we also know, and you, know, you have plenty of books that um, sustain this, that uh, the family wealth and this, the the sustaining and preserving family wealth across generations um, is not a technical issue or not entirely a technical issue, but most of the times it is a relational and emotional and a family issue in a sense that there might be different um, problems that emerge, that arise as uh, families evolve and grow. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure you have heard the term or the expression shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations, right? So you have one generation that builds the, built the business, the second generation tries to grow or preserve the business, the third generation either destroys the business or sells the business. Mm -hmm. This implies that there are some issues that are um, implicit within the family development over time, family business development, business family development over time. And what are these issues? So one issue could be the increasing number of family branches that lead to the, to the exclusion of specific branches in the management of businesses or wealth, or the decrease of the sense of legacy, identity, and unity and purpose that family members feel and experience over time, right? especially if you have sold the family business, because you see yourself only as uh, an owner of money, an owner of wealth, but you don't, you're, you're not building business. You're not an entrepreneur, you just own money. You can have conflicts between cousins and between branches. You have decreasing family social capital. So you don't have that strong affective ties across, between family members that, he, that your family used to have a few generations before, but you have many relatives, many family, family members who, however, are not equally um, strong ties to you, right? They're might just people that you meet once a year or once every three years. They might or might not share your surname. You might have a uh, you know, very old ancestor, uh, in common, but not much, not much else. Um, and there is also the detachment of next generations from the businesses or even wealth shame. Mm -hmm. um, so being ashamed of owning wealth. And I think this is also very culturally specific and it would be very interesting to, to know more about it. And uh, in this regard, I suggest the books by um, Jim Grubman and Dennis Jaffe on, on this uh, wealth shame. Uh, what, so, were the names? what were the names you said? So uh, one is uh, Jim Grubman, G-R-U-B-M-A-N. And the other one is Dennis Jaffe, J-A-F-F-E. Um, Dennis Grubman, uh, the Jim Grubman uh, published a book 
a few years ago called Strangers in Paradise. Um, it's very interesting because in that book, he says, while wealth creators are immigrants in the land of wealth, because they may start from a low class or middle class background, and then they come to have to become wealthy. Mm -hmm. um, the next generations, the heirs are usually um, natives of the land of wealth because they already they are already born and socialized within that that system within that broad set of norms. And of course, this is uh, important to to consider. So family office. So we talked about the importance of having a business family perspective and that this perspective implies a focus on the wealth of the family. And the family office is the organization that is dedicated to manage the wealth of the family. And in this, in this article, we define the family office more specifically as an organization that is dedicated to providing tailored and holistic service to respond to the family needs in order to maintain transgenerational control over the financial, human, and social emotional wealth of the family. So again, there is this idea of wealth preservation. If you have a family office, you have more chances to ensure that your wealth is preserved across generations because along the development of the family, of the business family over time, you have problems, you might, you might experience problems, issues, conflicts, traumas that split the family and um, destroy the unity of wealth, essentially. So the family office is a, is a, is a, uh, is a tool that families can use to counter this, this trend. Why are family offices created? You might have different functions of the family office. You want to preserve the heritage of, and the legacy of the family. You want to ensure wealth and prosperity across generations. You want to establish family governance structures like, family, like a family constitution or the family council. You want to provide a strategic guide to family wealth, especially after the sale of the family business. You want to develop an institutional approach to investments. You know, family offices are usually dedicated to asset allocation and investing and uh, managing uh, wealth across asset classes or and or diversification. So one of the function of family office might be diversification of wealth from the business or if you don't have a family business, of course, diversifying wealth itself. Um, we also know that the family office, which is, and here I'm talking about single family offices. So organizations that are uh, wholly owned by a family and they're an organization that provides services only to such family. Hmm? So this idea of the family office is very old because uh, we have been dealing with, with wealth preservation since people have started to accumulate wealth thanks to the division of labor. So it is a thousand years old concept. But the family office as an organization, as we know now today, started around in the 19th century uh, in Europe by aristocratic families uh, for the function of diversifying real assets, real estate assets. And a few decades later, also US Anglo-Saxon families started to um, implement um, a family office. However, I would also say that while in Europe, the family office has a, an, an aristocratic origin that is built by noble people of European aristocracy. In the US, such families are not noble families, but in the US, family offices are born due to industrial families, to entrepreneurial families who didn't have inherited money since uh, uh, the 13th century, but they built wealth in the mid 19th century 
and they built, of course, a lot of wealth, such as Rockefeller, such as Pritzker, such as uh, Phipps family, and so on, the Morgan family, and so on and so forth. All names of families that are very well known in um, around the world. Uh, let me just take, for example, the Bessemer Trust, which is now a professional service company. It was founded in 1907 to administer a part of the wealth, $50 million uh, of uh, that time. Uh, of course, in, in real terms, it is way, uh, way more today. Uh, received after the sale of the Carnegie, Carnegie Steel Company to JP Morgan. And um, it was um, set up by uh, Henry Phipps, which was the partner of Andrew Carnegie in, uh, in the Carnegie Steel Company. Any questions so far? No. No? OK. So this is a. Any question? Um, Just one minute. Uh, yeah. Francisco, is there any question? OK. He wants to write. Okay. Wants to write. Uh, I'll proceed and then and then yeah. I'm just can do the, the question. So um, here we have a representation of the family office ecosystem. So very basic. On the one end, you have the family office, which is this organization, this captive, and provides professional services to the family. And on the other hand, you have family principles that own and control the family office. So in theory, what happens is that family principles, which are usually um, you know, the senior generation of the family who holds the uh, control of their, over the strategy and the vision of the, of the family ownership group, uh, sets the objectives, monitors, and uh, gives a strategic vision of where to go next, um, you know, in terms of, of, of strategy. I think Francesco is saying, writing a question. So are there fundamental differences between European family offices, and American ones? I mean, in purpose, operational and so on. Um, so I think so. Um, so in terms of purpose, I really don't know because it is very specific and it, it's very, um, very, very ideographic. So it, it cannot be generalized, but usually American family offices are, um, are larger on average. So, and, and this is uh, uh, interesting because the, uh, the US context have been uh, captured by you know many uh, decades of saying that under one billion dollars you cannot have a family office. Um, while and so all the all the families that under one billion usually don't have a single family office. So in the U.S. you generally have these very large, very structured, very organized family offices. While in, in Europe, there is more heterogeneity in the sense that you have also smaller family offices. Uh, yeah, and then you, and also in the US, um, there's also, I think, a bit more attention to intangible aspects because the American, um, the American context has been for decades now again, um, focused on building a conceptual uh, a, a concept of wealth that goes beyond financial wealth and um, economic wealth. So spiritual wealth, intellectual capital, and so on. Uh, okay, so okay, so let's go back to the, to the presentation. This is the more or less the, the um, situation where uh, describes who owns the family office, who gives services to what, and so on. The point here is, however, that 
there is an elephant, an elephant in the room that are next generation family members. And uh, why is it, is it important? It is important because the next generation family members are to be principles. Mm -hmm. So they are family members who will become principles eventually, but at the moment they have low power within the family ownership group because they might not be involved in setting the strategy of the family office or the family strategy in general. And uh, if they're not involved in uh, controlling and setting the strategy of the family office, they have virtually no authority over the allocation of capital. Mm -hmm. And this is something that um, it is very important in family offices because oftentimes family offices are run with a very old mentality because owners and principals are old. So they are, they are um, sort of resistant to change. But we see it also in the family business as well, of course, right? So we have many cases of family businesses that are run by, um, you know, senior gen family members. And when the next generation family member comes in, they try to renew everything, right? But at the same time, it is difficult because there was, also, there was always the founder's shadow. So we know that the, the, the shadow of the founder is very persistent. And so it limits the scope of action of, of next generation family members. So now uh, I'm not going to cover uh, the operational aspects of the family office, but I want to, since the, the, the topic of today is purpose in the family office, I just want to make a few disclaimers. Mm -hmm. So let's try to understand what is not the purpose of the family office. So the purpose of the family office is not a purpose statement. It might be a statement, but it, it's not overlapping. The purpose of the family office is not necessarily the purpose of one family member. And the purpose of the family office is not the purpose of the family business, okay? Um, why is that? Because the purpose of the family office, uh, the purpose statement is just a statement and not a shared belief necessarily. The family office gathers multiple family members. So it is connected to the family vision, but not the one, one family member vision for the for the family itself and the family office since it, it deals with the management of wealth cannot be entirely consistent with the purpose of the family business might be might not usually it's better than it it, it, it is not consistent with the family business purpose mm -hmm. so there are different perspectives that uh, we can use to make sense of what is purpose in the family office. And uh, research has shown uh, two perspectives. And uh, again, disclaimer, these are perspectives. So I'm suggesting that the inside out perspective on purpose and an outside in perspective on purpose. I build on uh, John Almandot's typology of organizational purposes but they're not distinct purposes. They're just perspectives that we can use to make sense of the purpose of, of the family office. So the inside out purpose of, of an organization is consists in the shared beliefs about why the organization does what it does. It is usually connected to the character of the organization, to the historical character of the organization. So how the organization uh, built an image and an identity across time, right? So if I say, for example, Patagonia, every one of you might connect it with a very sustainable company that is authentic and committed to a more sustainable world. This is historical character. Mm -hmm. Purpose enables distinctiveness and specificity for each organization because 
since it is built over history by one organization, it is distinctive. One, a purpose in one organization is different from the purpose in another one. Why is that? Because they just have had different trajectories by definition. And most importantly, an inside out organizational purpose also is supposed to generate meaning, worth, and value for the work that employees and managers do. And here I quote a janitor in the, at the NASA agency during the John Fitzgerald Kennedy tenure. So during the uh, uh, lunar uh, explorations and missions, there is a janitor uh, who said, I'm not mopping the floor, I'm putting a man on the moon. So there's, this, so there's this sense of connection between what you do as a day-to-day -day task with the ultimate purpose of the organization. So why you do it? You don't do it because you want to gain money necessarily or you or something else or because you want to make your boss happy, but it, it is because you are fulfilling the purpose of the organization, which in the NASA case was putting a man on the moon. Inside out means that starts from inside and it is connected to the outside. The other perspective is exactly the opposite. So it captures the purpose as, uh, uh, as the outcome of societal pressures and discourses. Mm -hmm. And usually it is not the purpose of one organization, but it's the purpose of one organizational form. Mm -hmm. For example, what is the purpose of the corporation? The general, the general answer to this question, maybe not now, but a few years ago, it would have been shareholder value maximization, right? This is the purpose of the corporation. Um, it is evident that not every corporation has this purpose because every corporation has a distinctive activity, a distinctive um, way of conducting business and so on. But if we think about the corporation as a form, as a template, then it is possible to say that the purpose of the corporation is shareholder value maximization. And this idea of shareholder value maximization is not equal for every uh, corporation. And it is part of the institutional fabric of the field that, that such form inhabits and as such generates pressures to maintain legitimacy. So a, a few decades ago, if you were a corporation and you claim that you were not making, you were not maximizing shareholder value, you would have got into big trouble by your shareholders, right? Legitimacy, right? When you try to diverge from the, the legitimate practices and what is it is appropriate for an organization to behave, then you incur into costs, stigma, illegitimacy, and so on and so forth. This also means that uh, this purpose can change over time because logics change. Logics that operate in societies change. So today, the shareholder value maximization purpose is not fully legitimate anymore because we know that there are stakeholders' concerns that are started to gain legitimacy. And uh, the 2019 Business Roundtable statement on the purpose of the corporation clearly says this, hmm? that the purpose of the corporation is not to maximize shareholder value, but it also to consider stakeholders concern into business uh, conduct. Hmm? Um, now, how does it relate to impact investing and to you know, shifting the purpose of in family offices? Well, my claim here, my argument here, is that the impact investing revolution is shifting the outside-in purpose of the family office from wealth preservation only to something else. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because the family office as an organizational form have been predicated, built over the purpose of preserving wealth. While with impact investing, which is a financial practice that aims at generating a measurable social impact alongside a financial return, you have a combination of different logics. 
where one is more established that, while the other one is more emergent. Um, the impact investing logic is different from traditional investing and from traditional philanthropy. Um, impact investing is not a very consolidated field yet. So there is still a lot of ignorance and um, you know, experimentation with what impact investing is actually in practice. It, you, you need to have new instruments, tools, measurements, but also changing the mindset, changing what, what your money is about. Um, and also, and more specifically for family offices, impact investing might come across to some family members as a practice that negatively influences the rate of return on investment, and therefore on the amount of resources that are under the control of the family principles. So it might be perceived and framed as a direct enemy to the sustainability of family wealth. And I think this is why this is so difficult to integrate impact investing. Yep. Uh, Luca, uh, can you just go back to that inside out versus the outside in perspective? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So um, you're basically saying that the family business purpose might be inside out, whereas the FO has an outside in purpose. So I think, no, so um, here I'm only talking about the family office. Yeah, I understand that. Yeah. Why I'm asking you is because in your previous slide, you also spoke about the next gen coming in. You know, that slide which you had. Yeah. 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 Um, so the nature of the family principle is then going to the, the, the constitution of the family principles will then change the kind of um, purpose of the family office itself. Mm -hmm. Right. Because mm -hmm. if you have a next gen, which is far more socially sensitive, mm -hmm. then whether the organization is going to transform mm -hmm. is my question. Or is it going to be only the FO which transforms? I have a process model on this. <laughs> okay. So and maybe I can I can go directly to this, which is yeah. um, my, my, my theorization. Um, so, um, is, this a, so is this a 2021 paper? Uh, no, this is a, a working paper okay. that I'm currently uh, working on, which is close to submission. Okay. So here, here I am uh, proposing a process model of how next generation drive purpose change in the family office. So. We know that family principles are usually entrenched in the current strategy of the family office. We know that next generation family members have comparatively low authority and power over the family office. And also next generation, next generation family members and the family principles might have diverging visions about what is the actual purpose of the organization and whether we need whenever whether it is appropriate to engage in impact investing or not. Mm -hmm. So in this um, process model, I suggest that next generation family members engage in a four stage process where it starts from a sense of discomfort where next generation family members experience the contradiction between the position of the family member as a member, a wealthy, rich member of a elite family and the dominant logic of the group that she inhabits, that is the wealthy family. And so this sense of discomfort of, you know, connected to, um, it's usually connected to um, a discomfort regarding um, the capability of the next generation family member to do anything. And this is the problem that heirs have usually. They inherit money that did not contribute to make. And so they find themselves with these large buckets of money, but without any real purpose. 
So this sense of discomfort between the current situation and their um, desired future, future state is what leads them to initiate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, in order to initiate change, they need to usually engage in um, political tactics to integrate uh, an emerging and not legitimate logic within the family office. How do you do that? They usually build sub-coalitions, they engage with in uh, issue selling tactics vis-a-vis -vis the family principles, so they convince them of that they, that they are competent in what they're doing, that they can uh, do a lot by uh, gaining uh, small wins over time and to gain momentum for, for change. The third phase is justifying change. We have seen in our research that next generation family members cannot only engage in political tactics. So tactics that um, lead to a shift in resources, alloc resource allocation and uh, um, power position within the family ownership group. Mm -hmm. So it's not about only about influencing decisions. It's, only, it's also about justifying that, such decisions. And uh, we have seen that there are at least two rhetorical history strategies that enable next generation family members to connect their activity with the history of the family. And uh, I see here one, two strategies. The one is uh, picturing continuity with responsible ancestors and saying, you know, our ancestors two centuries ago was a very uh, sustainable driven person. And now we're just adapting his or her vision to today's world. So it, we, are, it, it, so it's, we are just renewing the legacy of our ancestor. The second strategy would be repenting in the sense that and this is specifically important in the, in the in cases of legacies of irresponsibilities. So whenever you have family businesses or families who have these uh, legacies of irresponsibilities, such rhetorical strategies uh, um, are, le are, are led towards uh, repenting, towards making amend of, of the past and start again, take responsibility and start again on a blank slate. The fourth stage is also the, is the maintain change. So you initiate change, you justify change. So you, you convince the family principles that impact investing is good. It should be implemented, it is implemented. The fourth phase is about maintaining such change and ensuring that such changes are not just ephemeral and momentaneous, but they are actually long lasting. They're producing, they're producing real effects over the long term of, in the family office. And here we, we theorize three main mechanisms. The one is recreating intergenerational family unity, which might have been broken during the previous stages. Mm -hmm. Creating family and investment governance structures like an investment policy statement or family constitution where everybody is on the same page and everyone agrees with. And, and ultimately generating a common frame across family members of the purpose of the family and the family office. And you can see below, and we don't have time, but um, for, for your information, you see below also potential disengagement consequences in the sense that not all processes of integrating impact and change in the family office are successful, but you can also have disengagement by the next generation family member, right? You can, it can exit the, the family, it can stay loyal to the family logic as it is and not initiate change and maybe live with a sense of discomfort for his or her life. And of course, this also creates a lot of trauma as well and dysfunctional psychological problems. You can go back to the old order or you can breach the family identity. So all of them, uh, I see that they might be also potential intended consequences of the process. Um, so this is uh, this is what we have. Uh, this is my 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 process model and uh, my working paper. And uh, I know that we are already late, but um, if you have any question, 
uh, either here, uh, you can do it, of course, of course, if you are free, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn or send me an email and uh, I would be very glad to respond to your questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Luca. Thank you so much. Any questions? Adriana, hi. Adriana has dropped off. No, she's there. Francisco has a question. How many FOs are in this process? In percentage? Um, well, it's uh, very difficult to do any kind of estimate in this. Um, but at the same time, um, I think the impact investing field uh, accrues to a few trillions. So family offices are uh, considerably shifting to impact investment. Um, not all of them do. Some of them might just use traditional philanthropy, and this is very, um, you know, very e like easy in the sense that families have been doing this forever. Um, so I, I cannot, I cannot provide any any, any figure. Thank you, Luca. Thank you so much. Thanks, Francisco, for that question. I think it's a very interesting uh, work in progress, Luca, and uh, wish you all the very best. I, Thank I you. would have I would have my own uh, views on what I'm seeing in India because I'm I'm not so sure because this gives a certain and that's that's my opinion. It gives a certain unidimensional picture of the next gen coming into the FO. Yeah. Right? Um, yeah. And the way I look at it is that, and anecdotally what one has seen is this conflict, uh, not just of the next gen, but among the next gen, mm. mm -hmm. right? It, it's not just a conflict. It is not just an intergenerational conflict, which leads to cessation or, you know, um, the, mm -hmm. the next gen trying to breach the family identity because that in itself holds the key to a very different set of conflicts. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You know, so, and what we are seeing here is also a lot of uh, the next gen using their wealth, private wealth, yeah. to kind of run with whatever they want to do. Yeah. And the family office then kind of focuses on a family purpose. And that's the reason why I was asking you, is there a difference between the purpose of the family itself changing, uh, which then leads to an FO purpose being different? Or is it that the FO is transforming from an outside into an inside out? So I think so, there's uh, a lot of scope here. Yeah, uh, and uh, you know the, the, the topic is just emerging. Um, yes. Um, my, my take on the last point is that in in phase four, in the in the maintaining maintaining phase, yes, the outside in and the inside out purposes are coupled together. Are 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 coupled coupled okay. together. Okay, converging. Yeah. So in a sense that on the one end you have the family office that integrates impact, and on the other hand you have the restoring of family vision. That cuts across generations and 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 you know unity. Right, Mahesh, that was the um, the question that I had asked also. How does this dynamic change? Uh, focus on what is Yeah, no, uh, this is yeah, no, uh, this is it is a uh, um, I mean it it is uh, it adds another layer of complexity. I think I tried to capture this in the building sub-coalition mechanisms. So it's not just, I agree, it's not just about next generations versus the family principles, it's also being able to bring people on your side. And these might come from your cohort, your generation. Right. So I agree. And this is only for the family office change, of course, you can also do secession, right? 
You can exit to the family strategy and the family structure, and you can pursue your own investments. That's perfectly fine, but in this way, you don't initiate change, which is fine as well. Uh, you know, it's just you know different different um, outcomes and different processes. Yeah. Thank you for your question, by the way. Thank you, Lucas, so much. It gives us so much food for thought, I think, um, because this is, as you said, a completely emerging topic. Maybe we can just stop the screen share. Yeah, sure. Thanks to all of you who were here today. Thank you all for being a patient audience. And uh, I, I believe that, uh, you know, we are going to see some more papers from you, Luca, on this. I hope so. We look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. And thank you uh, to Luca on behalf of SBJMR CFP. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.